Chad asked Kayla to be his wife. He told her that from that moment on, he wanted his identity to be bound up with hers. He wanted to start a family with her. And he told her he would love her faithfully until his dying breath. She agreed. And so while she was smiling and blushing, he slipped a ring onto her finger. And then, well, then they departed from each other and didn't see each other for another year. Now, this is part of a love story, uh, a story of connection that I discovered at Duke University when I was studying religion and politics. So I took the two topics you're not allowed to talk about at dinner and, and made them my whole career. Um, and I began to research that story in more depth right at the same time that I personally was looking for a different approach to sex and love than what Duke's hookup culture had to offer. I was searching for a deeper sense of shared life and shared joy with another person. And even in today's sex app generation, I'm not alone. Earlier in 2017, uh, the largest ever international survey of sex and technology showed that more people go online to use apps in search of meaningful, steady relationships than they do looking for casual hookups. See, many people today still want sex and romance to mean something. And what gives meaning to individual acts and events are stories. We interpret the world and we understand the meaning of things by fitting them in a larger underlying narrative. And so I decided that if I was going to be able to think differently about sex and love, I needed to find a different underlying story, a different kind of love story. And I found it in a very unlikely place. In research I was doing into ancient Jewish culture, and in particular, the process of moving through betrothal to marriage in that culture. And I would like to share that story with you today. I refer to the uh, typical young Jewish male and female as Chad and Kayla, because the Hebrew term for groom is chaton, and the Hebrew term for bride is kala. Now, in this story, perhaps even before Chad and Kayla met, Chad and his father would write down the terms of a marriage covenant on a document called a ketubah. And then they would travel to Kayla's house and discuss this document with her and her father. Chad would then offer Kayla a cup of wine, saying, this cup represents a covenant in blood. And that was the typical way of sealing betrothals in that culture. The wine represented the uh, blood of a slain animal. As if to say to the other partner, if I violate the terms of this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me. And then he said, today I have become your husband and you have become my wife. And then they headed off to Niagara Falls for a honeymoon and lived happily ever after. Now, actually, that's the point at which they departed one another and did not see each other for another year. What was going on? Well, in the Jewish culture, it was tradition that Chad would go back to his father's homestead and he would begin to build an additional room called a chuppah onto the house. And this would become the residence of the new couple. Now, when the room was done, Chad and his family and friends would set off to claim Kayla as his bride. And then both parties would process back to Chad's father's homestead. Now on that day, Chad would be wearing a seamless tunic, scented with frankincense and myrrh. And if they could afford it, both Chad and Kayla would wear golden crowns on their heads. They were king and queen for a day. And Kayla would also wear a veil over her face. Now, when they got back to the homestead, several things would happen. First, they would once again read from that covenant document again. They would once again sip wine from the same cup that they used 
at their betrothal. And then they would enter into the private hoopah. Chad would lift the veil from Kayla's face and they would consummate the marriage sexually. Now, as Jewish tradition held, the newlyweds would remain in the hoopah for seven consecutive days. So, yes, guys, I too felt inadequate when I first heard that, but that's only after those seven days would they emerge and celebrate this grand wedding feast. Now, I'm not Jewish, but along with my college girlfriend, Karen, uh, who later became my wife, uh, I became intrigued with that story. We certainly did not want to adopt the process in its entirety. There are lots of elements of that story that are problematic to modern Western sensibilities. But there were some insights that I learned from that story that fundamentally shaped the way that I approach sex, love, and marriage. First, in this story, love was less of a feeling in the gut than a commitment of the will. In fact, this story invites us to see love as an action, not just an attraction. Today, we're very used to thinking about love as a sort of sweaty palms, butterfly in the stomach sort of feeling. But Chad and Kayla may not have even seen each other before their betrothal. So they may not have experienced those sorts of romantic feelings or physical attractions up front. So rather than first comes love, then comes marriage, Love seemed to be something that was learned as a result of enduring the ups and downs of married life. In other words, love was more of a verb, an action that they would do, rather than a noun, a feeling that they would experience. Now, if that's true, then we need to examine carefully how we speak about it. Karen and I began an experiment to try to only use the word love as a verb rather than a noun. And so we gave up using phrases like fall in love and love at first sight. Just think about what those sorts of phrases assume about the kind of thing, the kind of noun that love is. Now, when I first saw Karen, our eyes met across a crowded room, I certainly felt that noun, that feeling of infatuation. But I had not yet done anything for her. I had not yet acted in any way for her good. And so we say that at that moment it was infatuation at first sight rather than love. Now, as, as fate would happen, uh, have it, uh, later a country western song by Colin Ray became our song. And the title, of course, was If I Were You, I'd Fall in Love with Me. Um, Sure enough. Uh, In fact, uh, earlier this year, I wrote a book on these insights and entitled it In Love. So obviously, we were not too legalistic about this. If committing to love someone means committing to act for their good, then it can be a very positive thing to write down exactly what those concrete acts of love are. Karen and I did this uh, shortly before she flew to Vienna, Austria for a study abroad semester her junior year. Now, human beings simply cannot commit to maintain certain levels of emotion. We can commit to practice certain acts. So, anticipating that our uh, emotions would likely plateau or perhaps even decrease, uh, we wrote down seven specific acts that we would devote ourselves to during our time apart. We lovingly refer to it as our relationship constitution. And we signed it and dated it and wrote it in very formal language. And sure enough, when the going got tough, it was very helpful to pull out that sheet of paper And to know that the other person halfway around the world was committing to seven concrete acts of love for the other. I still carry 
that piece of paper in my wallet to this day. Now, when Karen got back from Austria, we began to think very seriously about engagement, or as it's known in the ancient Jewish story, betrothal. But what struck us is that Chad and Kayla would have written down in detail their understanding, their expectations of marriage before they even got betrothed. And we thought that made a lot of sense. And so rather than undergoing premarital counseling, we enrolled in pre-engagement counseling. Just even for those who do go through premarital counseling, it often takes place, what, four or five weeks before the wedding. That means they've already booked the venue, They've already sent out invitations to every important person in their life. He's already purchased a ring. She's already fallen in infatuation with it. She and her mother have already seen her in the dress. All of that is a lot of pressure to have those premarital counseling sessions turn out a success, even if an unexpected problematic issue might arise. And so many couples proceed and they get married anyway just trusting that love will get them through. Well, several years ago, a licensed social worker uh, surveyed a 1,000 divorced women about their previous marriages and found that 30% of them admitted to having serious doubts about the marriage long before the wedding. You wonder how many of those relationships could have benefited from a more intentional approach to counseling and accountability up front, perhaps even before engagement. Well, when it was the right time for Karen and I to get engaged, we did so at the top of the Duke University Chapel Tower, uh, late one rainy April night. And I borrowed from the Jewish betrothal story by pouring a cup of wine and offering it to Karen. I did that to frame the relationship we were entering a a covenant rather than a contract. In a contract, two parties will come together to exchange goods and services, and after that exchange, they're free to go their separate ways. In a covenant, two parties come together to exchange identities permanently. They agree from that moment on to be known in the relationship to the other. Today, I am your husband, and you are my wife. Now, also like the Jewish betrothal story, we incorporated that same practice in our wedding. Like Chad and Kayla would have done, we once again sipped from the same cup that we used during our engagement. And I think the final lesson that I learned from this story had to do with another act that took place at the wedding itself. And that was the act of sex. You talk about wanting sex to mean something deeper. In that story, it accomplished something with legal implications. In the Jewish betrothal story, the purpose of sex was to consummate and renew a marriage covenant. So sex is covenant ratification, and renewal. I'd never thought about it that way. I think we all know couples who, you know, maybe 20 years after uh, their wedding, they decide to renew their vows, right? And so they hold a ritual where they recommit themselves to each other and to their marriage. What if we lived by a story in which sex had that sort of meaning? such that every time spouses practiced it, they were, in effect, renewing their vows. That is, recommitting themselves through their bodies to the other and to their marriage. I think that's the most important lesson I took from this story, is just how this ancient Jewish worldview and imagination understood certain acts as having the power to seal treaties and renew covenants. When the Jewish people perceived themselves to be the covenant partner of the creator of the universe, right back in the time of Moses, they practiced a very concrete act of covenant renewal. 
It was called the Passover meal. And every year that they celebrated it, they understood themselves to be making that covenant new again. And what began to emerge out of my research was just how this Jewish betrothal story became woven into that very history. About 1,500 years after Moses, Jesus was celebrating an annual Passover meal when he took a cup of wine. And he handed it to those in the room and he said, this cup is a covenant in blood. Now, in that culture, in that day and age, how might those words have been interpreted? Might those in the room have heard in those words a betrothal? Well, perhaps they remembered that at his birth, wise men brought Jesus gifts that a groom would have worn gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then guess what Jesus said? He said, I will not sip from this cup again until I do so with you in my Father's kingdom. Very interesting language. And then, do you know that he said, and now I'm about to depart from you. I'm going to prepare rooms for you. And I will return one day to claim you as my bride at the great apocalypse, the word apocalypse literally meaning the lifting of the veil, the great unveiling, which is described in some traditions as the great wedding feast of the Lamb. Something very intentional is going on there. He's not only telling the Jewish betrothal story, he's enacting it to help his followers understand something about the meaning of covenant Love. That's the power of a love story. And my research has had a very profound influence on my own love story. It's helped me to imagine love as an act of self-sharing. Marriage as an identity-sharing covenant. And sex as covenant renewal. I think we need to ask what stories are providing the script for relationships today? And might we not find in some very unexpected places stories that even now can help us make sense of our deep longing for intimate connection? Thank you very much.